Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything. As long as we use logic and common sense. This season we're talking about prayers, and this time we'll talk about the rosary. However, before we do, I thought it would be best to describe, perhaps the shortest prayer, the sign of the cross. The sign of the cross is the principal means which we use to bless ourselves. The precise way the sign is done has varied at different times and in different places, but generally the shape of the cross is traced in front of us by moving our hand to our forehead, then our lower chest, then both shoulders one at a time. While doing that, we recite the following words. In the name of the Father, we say this while touching the forehead, and of the Son, this is said while we touch our chest and of the Holy Spirit. Finally, this is said while we touch our shoulders. Then we say the word, Amen. This prayer is simple, but we can use it to bless ourselves in the name of each member of the Holy Trinity. This is a good prayer to learn, and among other things, it's used at the beginning of the next prayer we'll be talking about, the Rosary. Here's how we say the Rosary. First, we do the sign of the cross, followed by the Apostles' Creed. Next, we say the Lord's Prayer, then we say the Hail Mary three times, and the Glory Be once. From this point on, the Rosary is divided into five sections called Decades. Each decade consists of one Lord's Prayer at the start, then ten Hail Marys, and a Glory Be. And each decade has its own theme, or mystery. The mystery of the decade is said first, followed by the Lord's Prayer, and so on through the decade. When you finish the Glory Be, you say the first Fatima prayer, then say what mystery the next decade has, then continue on to the next, and so on, until all five decades are finished. After you finish the last decade, recite the Hail Holy Queen. Other prayers can be said at the end of decades or rosaries, or even before you begin, to devote the rosary to a certain cause or intention that you have. In fact, all the prayers we've been describing have been known to be said after decades or rosaries in the past. There are twenty mysteries that are often used for the rosary, fifteen of which go back hundreds of years. As there are five decades in a rosary, the mysteries come in sets of five. First are the joyful mysteries. The first joyful mystery is the Annunciation, which means the event where the angel Gabriel told Mary that she would bear Jesus, and she accepted it. The second joyful mystery is the visitation, where Mary went to visit her cousin Elizabeth while both were pregnant. The third joyful mystery is the nativity, the birth of Jesus, and the events surrounding it. The fourth joyful mystery is the presentation, when the baby Jesus was presented to the priests in the temple. The fifth joyful mystery is the finding of Jesus, when his family lost track of him on a journey, eventually finding him in the temple, speaking with the priests and elders. Second, the Sorrowful Mysteries. The first Sorrowful Mystery is the agony in the garden, Jesus' inner turmoil over his impending suffering and crucifixion in the Garden of Gethsemane. The second is the scourging at the pillar, when, in spite of his innocence, Pilate ordered him to be scourged. The third is the crowning with thorns, when the Roman soldiers forced a crown made of thorn bushes onto his head and mocked him. The fourth is the carrying of the cross, the actual journey when Jesus was forced to carry the cross up to Calvary. The fifth is the crucifixion, when Jesus was actually nailed to the cross and forced to hang there for three hours, at which point he finally died. The third group of mysteries are the glorious mysteries. The first glorious mystery is the resurrection, Jesus' return from the dead. The second is the ascension, when Jesus rose into heaven over a month after his return from the grave. The third is the descent of the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles in tongues of fire while they were hiding in the upper room. The fourth is the Assumption of Mary, when she was brought into heaven, body and soul. The fifth glorious mystery is the coronation, the crowning of Mary as the Queen of Heaven after she ascended. For many centuries, those are all the mysteries that anyone ever used, until, in 2002, Pope St. John Paul II proposed five more optional mysteries, the Luminous Mysteries. The first Luminous Mystery is the Baptism, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, and all three persons of the Trinity made their presence known simultaneously. The second is the Wedding Feast of Cana, where Jesus performed his first public miracle by turning water into wine. The third is the Proclamation of the Kingdom, where Jesus taught and preached, making his announcements about the Kingdom of Heaven. 
The fourth is the transfiguration, when Jesus shone like the sun on the mountaintop, flanked by Moses and Elijah, revealing for just a moment his real glory to the few apostles who he'd brought with him. Finally, the fifth is the institution of the Eucharist, when Jesus first transubstantiated bread and wine into his own body and blood, teaching the disciples to do the same. There's some controversy over whether or not the luminous mysteries should actually be considered part of the rosary. Some say that because the Pope said it, it can't be wrong, which is just a misunderstanding of the Pope's role and power. Others say that because they weren't part of the original list of mysteries as communicated to St. Dominic in the apparition that originally gave him the idea, according to tradition, and didn't, in fact, come from any heavenly messengers, that they can't be part of the rosary. My own view on this is that there is nothing wrong with praying the Luminous Mysteries, since unlike something like the Holy Mass or Confession, the Rosary is a private prayer anyway, which isn't set in stone like a sacrament. As far as I can tell, there are no Catholic doctrines to govern what mysteries the Rosary has or has not. I just don't see that this would be any disobedient or defiant action, but I also don't see any reason to think that the casual suggestion of the Pope places on us any actual obligations in this area. If you want to pray them, you're not hurting anybody. If you don't want to pray them, you're not being disobedient. Next time, a plea to God for cleanliness of spirit. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.